So if anybody isn't aware, my name is Wendy. I'm a lifestyle coach at Ethos Primary Care. I'm also a forager and a mushroom grower. My love affair with mushrooms started as a young girl foraging with my grandparents. And the love affair has continued ever since. I really love to delve into the mysterious fungal world. And today we're here with Dr. Ron Weiss, who I'm sure you're aware is a board certified internist, but were you also aware that he is a botanist? Yes, I was aware. I say botanist. It's a good thing. <laughs> but uh, yes, so for those of, those of you who missed anything, um, you know, I did, uh, did my undergraduate training in botany and, uh, and mushrooms are in a different, uh, different tree of life than our plants. Uh, and, the, and although we eat them like plants and they're part of a whole food plant-based diet, they are completely different organisms from an organizational sense, evolutionary sense. So, and we were just talking a moment ago that uh, 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 possibly one of the most important differences between plants and mushrooms are that plants create their own energy from the sun through photosynthesis. Plants have chlorophyll, the essential pigment that takes uh, sunlight, um, water, and carbon dioxide, and it changes it into fuel. Plants, uh, mushrooms cannot do that. And then we were talking a moment ago about the fact that um, there are, although Wendy just told us there are no mushrooms that are that can do that. Uh, once in a while in the universe, you do find uh, a a fungus teaming up with a plant symbiotically in the same uh, in the same uh, relationship to live together, and that would be an example with, of that would be a lichen, where the fungus attaches itself to the tree bark to give uh, the plant a substrate or a home to live on. And then you have an algae-like plant, uh, which that's the plant, which is photosynthetic, making food for the fungus. And they both Great. live together. Yeah, go ahead. So not only we're going to talk about symbiotic relationships, parasitic relationships, and saprotic relationships with mushrooms, we're also going to talk about their role in the environment, health benefits to us, and how to grow them. So what is a mushroom? Mushroom is part of the life cycle or the vegetative body known as mycelium. As the vegetative body continues to grow and needs to produce, it starts to start with the hyphae and then move on to, so a hyphae is a singular strand. And as those singular strands start to merge, they create mycelium. And that mycelium mat is the vegetative body of what we think of as mushrooms. As the vegetative body continues to grow and it needs to be reproduce, it grows up a mushroom. And that mushroom then will release spores into the air. And those spores are carried off into the wind so that it can reproduce in other locations. So if I get you correctly, Wendy, you're saying that when people, when you say vegetative body, this mass of mycelium coming together. Um, you know, we, most of the time, people don't see that, do they? It's under the ground or in the log or in the wood. Is that correct? Correct. And what most we do see place, is the fruit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What we do see is the fruit. That's the mushroom. It's the fruiting body. So people, yes. maybe you can explain that further. People don't, because I think they may not exactly understand that, but I thought it was interesting to point out. That the main business or living portion of the mushroom, you you usually don't see. It's it's right kept out of sight. 
Correct. If anybody has mulch in their yard and has ever moved mulch and you see this white cotton like substance, that's mycelium. So that is the vegetative body. If you think of it like a plant, it's the plant and a tomato would be the fruit. So the mycelium or that white cotton like substance, that's the actual plant body. And then the mushroom, as it emerges, that's the fruit for reproduction. And to me, the reason why it's so important to stress that, because as a soil enthusiast, uh, because and we must be if we want to eat really good food, um, I think people don't understand that uh, that a significant amount of the soil are fungi, right? The living organisms. And but you'll never when you look when you go through the soil you won't see mushrooms sticking out. There th that that fungi component basically or mycorrhiza and this vegetative body you're talking about, which are fairly difficult to see with the eye. In the singular strand, yes, when they get together into the mycelium mat, and we'll look at that a little bit later when I show you how to inoculate some logs, then you can see it. And then as that mycelium grows and starts to go through its cycle to create the mushroom, you might see first what's called a little button or primordia. And that's the very beginning of the growth. And sometimes mushrooms can appear overnight. 24 hours, even less sometimes. And then within 24 hours of that, they will degrade and die. They have sporulated, which essentially from the underside of, well, most mushrooms, some of them shoot them up. But from the underside, they will release spores and it looks like dust. And that dust is just carried off into the wind and then it goes to find a new host. Now, now here's another point where they are different than most plants, correct, Wendy? Because most plants um, reproduce by sexual pre reproduction, right? They're female and male uh, members that come together uh, and um, they, they contribute their genetic material to make a new individual, but that's not true here, is it? No. The mushroom just basically creates some little particles of itself in the spore and then casts them to the wind. Yes. And like our body cells continue to multiply, so do the hyphae. The hyphae find their host, whatever that might be. It could be a, a plant or tree root. It could be a decaying leaf. And it will just start to feed off of that and grow and grow and grow. So let's talk about why mushrooms are important. Mushrooms are now thought to be like the original internet. They have an intelligence that Japanese scientists is actually utilized to recreate their subway system. They are the lungs and the recycling powerhouses of the earth. Some of the amazing features of mushrooms include eating rock, making soil, digesting pollution, nourishing and killing plants, as well as reproducing foods, making medicines, and influencing the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. There are three different classifications of most fungal. So when we're looking at these, we're looking at the first one being, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. We have sapro, saprophytic, parasitic, and symbiotic. And the parasitic mushrooms feed off of living organisms. A few common parasitic mushrooms are chicken of the woods, one of Dr. Weiss's favorites. Yum. 
Lobster mushrooms that actually do taste like lobster and have a similar texture, similar to chicken of the woods, which has a chicken breast texture, as well as cordyceps. Cordyceps are, are used, uh, actually they grow, I should say, off of worms and other insects. Then we have the saprophytic. Now these are ones that feed off of dead organisms like leaf matter and fallen trees. And these are some that we're going to learn to grow today. So some common saprophytic mushrooms are oyster mushrooms and shiitake. The last classification is symbiotic that Dr. Weiss was touching upon earlier. And through symbiosis, these can detect disease on plants. They break down hard to digest nutrients within the soil, like rock that we discussed earlier, and then exchange or give nutrients to other living organisms to help them thrive. These are the ones that we use to cultivate the soil at Ethos and you can taste the difference in our produce. As Dr. and Weiss and I have walked around Ethos Farm, we've seen morels, artist conch, we've even found reishi, as well as fungal growth on trees that gave us signals that a tree was going to be dying of root disease, and we also see them in the fields. Dr. Weiss, can you talk a little bit about the importance of fostering healthy fungi in the soil? I shall, but I just wanted to, uh, oh, that's a nice picture of me in the compost lot, uh, field. I just wanted to say I, I always look forward to these little walks and little explorations that we take on the farm, Wendy, because you, I always learn things about fungi that I don't know and their culture. I mean, I'm pretty good with the plants, but as I said, botany is not focused on mushrooms. And I remember that about two years ago or a year or so ago, when I, I asked you, I had difficulty identifying that fungus, which was at the base, it was coming out of, I guess, near a root at the base of a, a, an enormous Norway spruce we had. Um, and um, you know, it was that um, it was that parasitic fungus that was in the I guess in the chicken of the woods category. And uh, I can't remember its name right now. I don't know if you remember, but you you immediately identified it, and it was sort of a little spooky because you know, even though the tree looked well, you know that this tree is going to be dying. The fungus will eventually move through the tree and kill it uh, within what like five, 10, 15 years or so. Yes. So I find these things fascinating. Um, yeah, it's kind of eerie to get those flags and we can't do anything about it. It's just giving us do. an indicator of the future. Yeah, and you know that that tree will no longer be with us. And not tomorrow, it looks perfectly well, but you know it's time is coming. Um, so when it comes to, uh, you know, growing whole plant foods that are nutrient dense and that help us reverse our, you know, health challenges. Um, I guess this subject uh, goes to the core of why Ethos Primary Care is even on a farm. And it's because we believe that food is medicine. And moreover, that whole plant foods are medicine. And moreover that, that well-grown and conscientiously whole plant foods are the best medicine. And in order to grow those top level whole plant foods that have all the plant nutrients that we need, it starts with a living soil, not soils that have been treated with pesticides and have not been taken care of or that have been mined over and over again by growing crops there and no one takes care of it. You really need a living soil with bil billions and billions of little organisms and even a tablespoon. And one of the most important kinds of organisms in that soil microbiome are the fungi. And 
there are all different types of fungi, but the ones that farmers and, and soil scientists concentrate on the most are called the mycorrhizae of the soil. And those are like those hyphae that you were talking about. Um, and the reason why uh, we concentrate on that and botanists concentrate on these uh, hyphae, these mycorrhizae, is because plants have evolved over millions of years to develop special relationships with these mycorrhizae, these little fungal filaments, where they actually grow into the root hair the plant cell and communicate with the plant. When the plant needs something, let's say the plant senses, and plants are a lot smarter than we think they are, by the way. When, uh, when I call it plant intelligence or intuition, when they sense that, oh my God, there is a, there is a flea beetle landing on my leaf and I'm an arugula plant and it's starting to chew and I want to create my own natural weapon or pesticide to make that flea beetle, that insect go away. If I'm a plant, I go down to my workers in the soil, and that includes that those fung fungal mycorrhizae, and tell them to get me, for example, I need an, a, a, an atom of molybdenum or an atom of magnesium, and they will go get it in the soil for me, bring it back, I'll, and I'll use it to assemble my pesticide molecule and then I'll beat off my enemies with it. But we, we need those mycorrhizae in the soil. They're critical for plant communication and accessing minerals in the soil that the plant can't get itself and molecules. And also, um, we are beginning to think that these mycorrhizae, and I don't know if you have any more information, please feel free to add at any time, Wendy. Uh, or perhaps serve as networks of communication between plants. Like if if I'm an arugula plant and, and, and an insect lands on me and starts chewing on my leaves, I will let the other arugula plants in my row and next to me know this so that they can, the other arugula plants can start making weapons against a, a expected attack of these flea beetles. Isn't that amazing? And we think those communications in the row or in the locality of the field or the soil occur using the network, like, like, like um, Wendy said before, using the network, this super highway of information, and there are the, the mycorrhizae of the fun fungi in the soil. So, that's why these uh, these things are very important to us here. And if you want to read a great book uh, and understand how important these mycorrhizae are, I highly recommend a, a, a book by by a friend of ours and and the leader in um, the regenerative and holistic growing of fruit without pesticides, Michael Phillips, out of Lost Nation, New Hampshire. And his book is called Mycorrhizal Planet. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Yes, studies have shown that uh, for trees, for example, utilizing your metaphor of the plants, that if the mother tree is infected by a parasite or has some affliction to it, she will send off a warning signal to her sibling uh, her children and she will protect them so that she will take on the attack fully herself so they can survive so mycelium are so intelligent it, it's amazing what they can do and besides decomposing leaf straw or wood matter that we're so familiar with which is essential in building healthy soil there's also fungi with amazing features that many of you, including myself the first time I heard it, are probably gonna be very shocked about. So there is a process called microremediation and through microremediation, fungi can decompose plastics, heavy metals, remove toxins from water, uh, even uh, waste from 
diapers, diapers that are in landfills, they have found that there's a mushroom that grows on those diapers and is actually edible afterwards. It, it's pretty scary to thought, but mushrooms can really help save our environment. It helps in the restoring process and seeking balance again. And, and we're just uh, jumping into these. Wendy, I just wanted to add in the farming community, you know, uh, farmers, um, organic farmers like to make compost, right? Yes. And what compost basically is, is it's uh, you take, you know, uh, organic materials like uh, kitchen scraps or leaves or, you know, wood chips, maybe sometimes some animal waste like manures, and you throw them all together and, and then this process of degradation uh, and and uh, begins. And, you know, there are two essential parts to this process. One is bacterial, but the other is fungal, where the funguses go through this pile of compost and break down uh, uh, materials which are extremely resistant otherwise without them to break down. And I was I was just talking the other day to someone, and we were talking about the fact that um, you know even uh, toxic molecules like drugs, like uh, for example some horses or animals may be given medications or drugs to to uh, you know to keep them alive, but if you use their stool or their or their manure in the compost. These fungi that are embedded in the composting process are so powerful, they can even take apart these toxic molecules so that by the, with, a, with, a, with a very um, excellently made compost, you can start off with a lot of toxic molecules, but at the end, by the time it's mature, it, they've been removed. Yes, indeed. Yeah, and they're breaking down that straw or hay that the horses are eating, as well as the grass and everything else, definitely. There's also, and you see in this picture here, there's a building. That building is made out of mycelium. It's the fungal network, that mycelium mat, that these blocks are being created out of. And this is to create more sustainable housing for people. There's also some being used for packing materials to make furniture, uh, leather-like materials for clothing and wallets. There's even some that mend cement. And there's, I, I could go on and on. There's so many different features that are coming out every day. In one of my groups, there's a woman who created a canoe out of mycelium so it floats, she can go canoeing, and then when she comes back and flips her canoe over, it doesn't she just dry, it fruits. She gets oh, mushrooms out of it, and really? it's just this regenerative body, yes. Wow, that is amazing. And yeah, they're edible? Do you know what kind of mushroom is it? I do not recall what kind of mushroom, no. Wow. I, I want to say oyster, but I'm not 100% sure. Wow. Amazing. So, Dr. Weiss, I know you love to consume mushrooms and often prescribe them to patients. Can you explain a bit about the compounds that make them so healthy? Yes. So, mushrooms have a lot of special compounds in them. Uh, they have a lot of uh, anti-inflammatory compounds, which we're we're at the very dawn of discovering and identifying exactly what they are, but we know as a whole, mushrooms do special things for our immune system. Uh, we know that they do two things specifically, two great things. They uh, help to alert our immune system and to make it, um, to make the immune system um, notice enemies better and attack them. And an example, uh, you know, during this COVID pandemic, and I've discussed this before, were are studies that show that just eating, you know, uh, a handful of mushrooms a day, you know, I like to eat maybe a cup of cooked mushrooms a day. Uh, and, and it can be any mushroom, even the plain white button mushrooms cooked. Um, 
By doing that, you can significantly increase um, IgA. IgA are antibodies or little bombs or weapons that our immune system manufactures in our saliva to attack as first line of fence anything that comes into us. So um, we know that to be true. The other thing is that we know that our immune system, and you, when, when I say it, our, you know, immune means defense system that attacks and, and guards us. It's a, it is really truly a system with a myriad different components, everything from cells to little molecules to networks. The networks uh, or the communications between the different components are made of molecules. And this network is called a humoral immunity. And we know that mushrooms uh, help to calm these networks so they don't go overboard in an attack. When the, they go overboard in an attack, you end up with what's called a cytokine storm. Cytokine storms are why you see all of these unfortunate individuals during COVID-19 going down in the second week of their illness, typically, where all of a sudden they have to be put on a respiratory because they go the a respiratory failure, their lungs fill up with fluid. You know, that's not directly because of the virus itself. It's because of our immune response to the virus, and it's just too much. So that's a little discussion on how mushrooms can affect us and help our immune system. Just a couple of other little items. You know, um, there is, uh, there are other, a couple, a other couple of notable items or nutrients in food, in mushrooms, including selenium, which is an important mineral, uh, which we should not be without. Um, you know, and it's important in the bones, it's important in your hair and your skin. Um, vitamin D, it, believe it or not, of all the foods that, that you can eat, of all the edible things that we put in ourselves, mushrooms are pretty much the only plant that we can get vitamin D from, albeit very tiny amounts. So it's really not worth eating mushrooms to get the vitamin D because it's small, you can get much more going out in the sun. Uh, and an interesting fact, the mushrooms make vitamin D when they're exposed to sunlight, which mushrooms are not usual. So I guess Wendy could tell you by putting the mushrooms on a, on a, out in the sun maybe, or on a sunny windowsill for, uh, you know, for a couple of hours, you could get a little bit more vitamin D. But as I said, it's, it's minuscule to begin with anyway. And, um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about beta, Dr. White. beta yes. Sorry, one. Uh, my request, and, and probably Wendy may have access as a host, my request to the participant is, would you please mute yourself? I do see some participants are not muted, and it kind of has a disturbance for us to listen. So we would strongly re uh, request, please mute yourself. And Wendy, you would also be able to see the participants that are not muted. All right, thank you. Sorry, Dr. Weiss. You, Asha. No. So the last thing I wanted to comment on was the beta-glucans. Beta-glucans are sugar molecules that are all joined together in huge strings, uh, and complex molecules, carbohydrates. And these beta-glucans have special properties where they, are, uh, they provoke immune systems to attack. And uh, but, in, but potentially in a good way in the mushrooms. Um, and we're, you know, mushrooms have a lot of them. They do exist in other things like maybe oats and a couple of other plants that we eat, but, but in high levels in mushrooms, we think that these beta glucans, and we're still studying it, but they help to augment immune responses to the valuable, um, that are provoked by the valuable molecules in mushrooms. And I was even reading uh, some studies in recently about, uh, you see these days, there are all these monoclonal antibodies. There's special new treatments in the past decade or so that have risen in the treatment of cancer. And, and um, we give these monoclonal antibodies to attack cancer cells. Now there are thoughts that the beta-glucans in mushrooms can help 
these treatments do their job better if they're given with the cancer treatments because because of the beta glucans that augment our immune uh, attack against the cancer cells. Um, and lastly, I guess any particular variety. Well, I think you know we at this time we think we like all mushrooms, edible mushrooms. Um, you know they, you know, and, and as I said, we're at the dawn of the dawn of discovery regarding if if um, this mushroom is better than that at, at treating this disease or versus that disease. But at this time, I can tell you, take your pick of the mushrooms that are available, use them always cooked because there are many mushrooms that have molecules that are, believe it or not, are carcinogenic and they're destroyed by heat. So always make sure to cook them well. And then you'll derive the, the great benefits of eating mushrooms. Okay, now we're gonna make a totem. So this first thing that we're going to do, we need to protect the ground and the mycelium, keep them separate. So we're gonna put down a piece of cardboard here. And then we're gonna take our mycelium. This is our beautiful oyster spawn on sawdust. Oh, if you could smell that, the wood floor mixed with oyster mushrooms, it's divine. We're just gonna break that up. We're gonna take about a cup. This is a little bit more. We're gonna just break that up real quick. We want about a half an inch layer on the bottom. This will allow the mushrooms to start growing from the base of the tree. And this is our trunk. This is our 12 inch trunk here. And this is wonderful because it has a naturally demarked line there. So we have our spawn underneath and then we're just going to take if you consider the log itself to be a cake layer this is going to be our icing or filling layer we're simply just going to put a nice layer about a half an inch to three quarters of an inch thick on there breaking it up as much as possible. Just spread that out nice and even. Then we're going to place our second layer of our totem or cake right on top. See how those line up very nicely there? Okay. Then we're going to place another layer on top. Now you want to do this in its final resting place because this totem, once it's complete, will weigh about 70 pounds or more depending upon the diameter. Now in this particular case, you see that we have two different layers, but you can add more layers. If you had a larger diameter log or trunk, you can make this a little bit thinner. These are 12 inch layers. You can go as thin as six inches and then you can utilize four layers or more depending upon the height. This is our top layer. This is going to protect from the mycelium from drying out, keep everything in place. So we have one, two, three layers that the mushrooms are going to grow out of. That's our ceiling layer. Then we're simply going to take a leaf bag, municipality leaf bag, and we're going to put this on top. This is going to keep away any insects or rodents. And we're going to tie that with a piece of string to keep out our rodents. And then depending upon the species of mushroom, in three to six months, we're going to have mushrooms starting to fruit. The bag will naturally decay. 
and then you'll be just left with a stump with mushrooms growing out. And each cluster could be about six to eight ounces, depending upon the length of time that the totem has been here and its fruiting conditions. Remember, you always want to have a canopy of shade and water about one inch of water per week. And don't forget to tag your mushrooms. You need to know which totems they are, what type of mushroom it is. Okay, let's talk about inoculating mushrooms and what we need to look for in wood. First, when you're looking at a tree, you want to make sure it's disease free. You want to look at the bark first and foremost. Your bark should be intact. There shouldn't be any damage or fungus to it. The second thing we want to look at is the sapwood, which is this outer ring, this lighter color to heartwood ratio. The sapwood is where the mushrooms are going to grow. So that's what we're really looking for. And to find a tree with a high ratio of sapwood to heartwood, you want to look for a tree, if at all possible, and it's not always possible, look for a tree that is self-standing. If it's in a dense forest, those trees are struggling to get their piece of sunlight. So they're reaching for the canopy, and as they grow very fast and tall, it's going to have a higher heartwood to sapwood ratio. So therefore, you want to, if you can, try to find trees that are a little bit more separated than a dense forest. The other thing is the time of year. When trees are dormant is the best time of year to have a tree cut down and used for mushroom inoculation. All of the sugars are stabilized within the tree itself. When it's springtime, what happens is you have all those sugars rushing through very quickly and that can cause separation between the bark and the sapwood which causes bark slip and if that bark slips off either as it's being cut down or while you're inoculating there's more room for competing fungus so that's something to keep in mind so dormant is the best time of year to have any tree cut down and here you'll see, this is part of a red maple that was cut about a month ago. And what I'd like to show you here is our drill marks. You see here, I've taken a drill and this is just a five ace bit with a stop on the end that's going to be a little bit longer than our plug spawn. So when it's drilled, there's going to be a slight gap in between the bottom of the drilled hole and the uh, plug that we're going to put in. Now they're six inches apart and then two inches on side of that invisible line. So that will cut a six by four diamond and you can see that diamond pattern up top here. And then we need our plug spawn itself and you can see that here. You can see that cotton-like substance. That's that mycelium that we were talking about earlier. And when we talk, cut, we take one of these in our hands and we kind of roll it, you'll see that that mycelium will crush, but that will grow again once we put it into the hole. So we're essentially just going to take our plug and we're going to tap it into the hole. And that one didn't go down flush, so we'll just do another one. That happens from time to time. Don't worry, we'll cover that up. Okay, there you go. We saved that one in very nice. Now all we need to do is cover that up. And there's many different sealing waxes you can use, but I use beeswax. It's the most natural. And you'll see this one will just cover that really nicely. And once we have all of these plugs covered up, then we are ready to make sure that we label it and then we lay it in the laying field, which is simply a place that you stack your logs while we're waiting for the spawn to run through. And then you'll see that all of these areas will become white on top and the mushrooms will pop through these plugs. Main thing to remember is moisture. Mushrooms like moisture and shade, so it needs to be in a shady area, whether that's under a canopy of trees, preferably conifers or pines, or you can put a shade cloth on top. Either way, keep them shaded 
keep them moist. The moisture from the ground is good, as well as in the middle of August, I usually water them maybe once or twice. You want about an inch of water a week, and then you're set. In logs like this, oysters will take close to a year to run through them and then start fruiting. With the totems that we did, those will take a shorter period of time, between three to six months for that run before you start to see fruit. Thank you very much. You know, I, I know you make it <laughs> seem so easy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's nice to know that, you know, you, I, I, you probably would have to, um, you know, just pay attention to all the details of, and the steps involved, but that you, you can, in your very own backyard, make these mushrooms. Uh, what, what are there further resources that you would recommend if, for somebody who, is interested in doing this after your presentation. Yes, uh, well, you, I have created a website for people, especially during COVID, where we couldn't find mushrooms to gather some of my network of people, growers together, as well as give information as classes. So uh, that would be yourmushrooms.com, and you can find me on Facebook. Uh, email wendy at yourmushrooms.com and I can post more pictures of the totems as they're growing as well. And you're right, I do many different trials. Uh, if there's woods that are told like white oak or maple that are great, yes, I use those as standards. But if somebody has a black cherry or ash, we have a lot of ash around here. So I dip, do different trials to see what will actually work in our area? Because some of the uh, amazing um, resources in um, fungal for protect, um, I'm sorry, fungi, perfecti, uh, field and forest, as well as some local like noble mushrooms, it depends upon where you're growing. Your growing conditions mean everything. And when you're talking about growing mushrooms, it you have to think about um, the environment, what they like. Similar to plants, tomatoes and tomatoes, uh, those uh, like sunny, hot conditions, uh, but then you'll also find that mushrooms, they only, realistically, they prefer the woods. They like shady locations, they like moisture, so you have to recreate that under uh, the canopy that you saw out back or uh, even better under pine trees is preferential. Uh, but there are some grow kits that you can get for inside your house as well. Wendy and Dr. Weiss, um, there are some questions on our chat. And Wendy, if you change to speaker mode, it, it just will help the recording because that way whoever is a speaker uh, will be in the record mode, so that you know. Uh, and Dr. Yes. Weiss, can you see I some of the um, questions, or do you want us to read it out to you? Um, I guess. Are you able to I, see? I this? don't see any questions now. Okay. Maybe you um, <clears throat> tell me how to do that. I, or can read read, I can read them out. So we we have our first question is. Must all mushrooms be cooked? Some are added in pre-made salads that are raw. This was from Eric. Thank you, Eric, for your question. Yes, it's recommended that all mushrooms be cooked. There are, uh, you know, there mushrooms have cell walls in them that are difficult to digest, to digest, first of all. And probably a whole family of the most common mushrooms that we eat which are the agaricus genus, which include the white mushrooms, um, the portobello mushrooms, the cremini mushrooms. Uh, the mushrooms in that family have a, a molecule called agaritine, which is a known cancer-causing agent, and it is destroyed by heat. So we recommend that you cook the mushrooms thoroughly. Um, 
yeah, cook them. Thank you, Dr. Weiss. Um, we have our next question, uh, Christina. Uh, dried mushrooms keep the same properties as, you know, raw mushrooms. I mean, they both are raw. Uh, but Wendy, do you want to feel this one? Uh, I'm, I think we can. It depends upon the temperature that they have been dried at. If they are raw still, which is technically under 110, then yes, they should maintain their original properties. Uh, however, as we were discussing earlier, whole foods, whether it be dried and then powdered, whole foods themselves, the mushrooms, have been found to have higher health benefits, as Dr. Weiss was saying earlier. Any I see one question on hole diameter. Uh, the hole diameter uh, when drilling is five eighths of an inch, and that can be a simple drill bit from a hardware store, and you can put your own stop on it. The plugs are about an inch long, and it, the stop on that is just slightly over. If you leave another tenth of an inch, that way there's a little bit of room for the mycelium to start growing, and then it'll grow into the woods. Uh, Wendy, you're going through the questions, right? Or do you want me to read it? Are you able yes. to see them? Okay, great. Um, there's another question from Diane. Where do we get the spawn? Um, there is Field and Forest, which is one of my favorites. Uh, when you talk to anybody about spawn, they should be no more than 10 generations out. For example, I have some oyster mushrooms that I found on one of my hikes, and I have a dear friend of mine who is local, and she doesn't grow mushrooms, but what she does is she prepares the spawn. So the plug spawn you saw downstairs was from her, and that's noble mushrooms, and she's based in Bridgewater. But the purpose is just like, um, Anything else, the further we go out in generations, the more possible defects you can have. So you want to keep within 10 generations, two to three is preferential. So uh, resources that I know that use generations two and three are field and forest, noble mushrooms, and fungi perfecti, who is uh, Paul Stamets, the great mycologist that uh, most of us know and, and love that's his particular company. Were there any other questions? Uh, that's not um so i could we uh, uh dr weiss do you have anything else or we I can just nothing else up? other than to thank everyone for coming today and thank you wendy it's uh you know you're our mushroom connection here at ethos thank you so much for all the wonderful things you do and, and the wonderful mushrooms you grow and Asha, thank you uh, so much for supporting this call. And Danielle, thank you for all of your assistance today, Jill.